You're right, Paul. I think this, it's it's been a reasonable year considering how bad we've we've had in the past, <clears throat> and I, it, it's a it's a decent year, and it's a year where risk is outperformed. Um, now, October thus far is has been miserable for risk, but if you're looking at the year to date, um, you know we see uh, the triple C credits are up, you know, really about well, threefold what uh, what double B's are. So we've had a fair amount of spread compression. So, but I mean, everybody's been telling Matt and I that. We're going to have a recession any day now. If that's the case, why are people taking incremental risks that they need to that they do when the they go into the spreads. highest phase? I mean, if you're paying me, I get it. But if you're not paying me, why am I buying it? Well, if you look at spreads where they are right now, you know, arguably they're only at the five and ten year averages, <clears throat> so they're not looking particularly cheap. Um, on the other hand, that uh, the economy has done pretty well, and I think that that's really what's been driving spreads. Is you know we'd all been waiting or expecting a, a recession, whether it was in the later half of the back, of the early part of the first half of the year, or then the back half of this year, and then people are forecasting it for early 2024. And thus far, the economy has continued to power through, and I think that's what's been driving spreads. But aren't you worried that defaults are going to start to pick up? Well, interestingly enough, if you look at the Moody's estimates, they're expecting defaults will peak sometime in the spring of next year, but at a fairly reasonable rate. But let's remember when Moody's puts out its numbers, it is an unweighted number. So they count a hundred million dollar default the same way they count a billion dollar default. If you look at it on a adjusted basis where they're using weightings based on the amount of debt outstanding, the default rate for this year is still running under 2%. Um, now, they're expecting the default rate to rise into the mid to high fours, uh, but that's a pretty big differential. So what it tells us is the companies that are getting into more difficulty tend to be smaller companies rather than larger ones at this point. What's the new issue market like? I used to love throwing out some high yield for my clients uh, back in the day because uh, I love the media cable paper. What's the what's the new issue market like these days? It's pretty soft right yeah. now. Not surprisingly, I think we had a pretty robust calendar coming into September and that there were a number of companies that had financings, whether it was M&A related or LBO related that needed to get done and they got those done. But since then, obviously, treasuries have risen fairly dramatically. Yep. And then on the back of the 50 beeps treasury move we've had uh, in the last four or five weeks, we've had about a 75 basis point widening of high yield. So I think companies have taken a step back and said, let's wait a minute here. Let's hope that spreads get tighter or hope the treasury rates come down and moderate and we'll find a better financing opportunity. Now, the problem with that from our perspective is if you wait too long and we are right and we do see more of an economic slowdown in 2024, which is what our expectation is, that would imply, as you're suggesting, that spreads ought to be wider, not mm -hmm. tighter. And if spreads are not wider, then the Fed's likely to keep its foot on the brake pretty hard because that says the economy's powering along too strongly and they're going to have to react. Right. So, or else you're playing along too yeah. much. You, yeah. you need to get a little bit more vigilante, don't you? <laughs> what can you do, by the way, in terms of, you know, uh, pivoting your strategy? You can't. Can you go up in quality if you're a co-director of high yield? Sure, yeah, and we've been doing a, a fair amount of that. And I think then the other thing you do is you go into sectors where you have a greater degree of certainty. So, you know, we look, affluent consumers are still spending. Cruise ship companies happen to be doing extremely yeah. well. And actually, if you look at their bookings through 2024, they're, they're solidly booked. Um, you know, we've seen some softness in the airline space, but the cruise ships happen to be different. You know, even if you're looking at something like home builders, you would say to yourself, well, how could home builders be doing well in this kind of environment? Well, right now, you know, secondary or uh, home sales are, are, have dried up because anyone that's got a three and a half percent mortgage or a four percent mortgage isn't going to sell their house and buy something new unless they absolutely have to because they're moving, for example, to a whole other state. So the only game in town right now is buying a new house. And the margins on the home building industry over the last several years have accelerated in a significant way. So they've got room to play around and offer extra financing support for the first two or three years. Um, they can bring down the quality or you know, put um, uh, carpeting in instead of hardwood floors. They've got room to maneuver, but the home builders are actually doing quite well. How about in the cable slash telecom space, big, big issuers in the high yield space historically, 
how are those are, are you guys have exposure there and, and what do you like or don't like we about do them? we do uh, you know the cable sector you know if we look back and you look at some of the names in the space on the equity side over the last you know, couple of years yeah. they've been under pressure yeah big time and i think that that's uh, reflecting a couple of things and one is the competitiveness of of wireless uh alternatives yep um, and then there was cord cutting is obviously going on. Uh, but I think we've seen some, some changes in the last several months. But they always particular. pay their interest in principle, though. Yeah, they are always paying their interest in principle. And I think, you know, think about how many of us are still working from home at least part time, maybe not in the office every day of the week. Um, and those people need broadband right, what's access. What's the average office professional? In Durham, North Carolina, what are they doing? How many days a week back in the office? I'm going to say we, we're in at least three days a week. At least and I'm going to say that's what most people are doing. See, that's